Live. Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we kick off a series of discussions of movies in the fairly recent genre of found footage. And we're starting with the movie that really became the trope codifier, as TV tropes would call it, itself, The Blair Witch Project from 1999. Now bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie which is hard to imagine, but if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to talk about the Blair Witch Project from the perspective of horror fans we have. So warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, creator of the Alex Van Helsing novels. With me from Austin is Tony Salvaggio, the lead singer of the band Deserts of Mars and co-creator of the comics Psycom from Tokyo Pop and Clockworks for Humanoids. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin is Drew Edwards, Writer for Rockabilly Online, creator and writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man. Say hello, Drew. Future writer of Fantastic Four from Marvel Comics. Yes, Drew is trying yeah, to get drafted, drafted to write Fantastic Four. You heard it here first. Who knows? I, can, I, I, think, I think actually I've read your Halloween Man. I think that would be brilliant. All right. If, also, if, if, if it's not an audition tape, I don't know what is. Precisely. No, it is. It, yeah, you're right. I, that's the that's the dirty secret of Halloween Man is that even though it's Halloween Man, it's actually uh, you call it weird science. I, I think they're really superhero comics, and and that's they're awesome. All right. Um, and also in Denver, as always, color commentary from Attorney Julia Guzman. Say hello. 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 Oh, and of course. As, as always, we have to turn to our sponsor. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash horror. That's audibletrial.com slash horror. You can try, you can look at over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. We'll have a recommendation in the middle of the show. And if you're a listener and you have recommendations, we want to hear them. Okay, according to Wikipedia, The Blair Witch Project is a 1999 American found footage horror film. That's a thing now, and it wasn't a thing then. It is an American found footage horror film written, directed, and edited by Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez. The film was produced by the Haxon Films Company. The film relates the story of three student filmmakers, Heather Mike and Joshua, who disappear while hiking in the Black Hills near Burkittsville, Maryland in 1994, so supposedly five years before it comes out, to film a documentary about a local legend known as the Blair Witch. The viewers are told the three were never seen or heard from again, although their video and sound equipment, along with most of the footage they shot, was discovered, quote, a year later, and this recovered footage is the film the viewer is watching, I mean, greatly edited. So this film received pretty positive reception from critics, went on to gross over $248 million worldwide, making it one of the most successful independent movies of all time. Having just cost $22,000. Cost, yeah, under $30,000. The DVD was re- the DVD came out October 26, 1999, and uh, incidentally, uh, it was not released in widescreen, so that sucks. Anyway, so let's get our opening thoughts. Let's go. Uh, I'm, I'm excited because I know at least one of you is not crazy about this film. Uh, let's go, we haven't done it this way in a while, Julia, Tony, Drew, and then I'll say anything in the opening, and then we'll, so, opening thoughts, Julia, Blair Witch Project. Well, I think I was the one to suggest this little picture, because um, I just had a really fond, I have this really bad habit or bad tendency to forget when I saw movies, who I saw them with. And Jason will say, don't you remember we saw it in this theater, and it was on this date, and there was this person next to you, and <laughs> all these details. I'm like, I, have no, I don't even remember seeing this movie. But this one, I remember. I actually remember the date wrong, though, because <laughs> I was like, wait, this is late 90s? I thought that I saw it in college. I guess I was wrong about that. But anyway, um, but I did see it at the college. I saw it at Dolby Theater in Austin. Um, and so I guess that's why I associated it with having seen it at college. And I just remember watching it and thinking, oh, my gosh, this thing is scary and trippy and bizarre because at the time there weren't 15 million uh, found footage films because this was the beginning of that era. And um, I just thought it was really interesting and spooky, and then I hadn't seen it since then, <clears throat> since it came out. So I was like, let's see it again and, and just you know, kick off this, this little retrospective, and um, and it did not disappoint. At first, I, I I was like, this isn't as scary as I remember. It's just kind of, you know, it's a little spooky or whatever. But then it gets really freaking scary at the end. I think. 
So I actually, um, I actually do find it frightening, and I think it's really interesting uh, the way they do it and, and fun. So I'm glad we watched it. Cool, Tony. What are your thoughts on uh, opening thoughts, Blair Witch? Well, I saw it. I think I was kind of late to the game as far as like a lot of my friends saw it in theater. Um, I was probably on crunch or something, and I didn't get to see it until I guess video. And it just, just didn't, just for it the didn't last. I mean, came to video. Crunch refers to the period when you're working on a video game and they start making you stay practically all night to try to get it. <sighs> yes. Yeah. Which is not anyway, the first continue. nor the last time. But, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I I was, you know, and I admired, you know, by then I kind of had it spoiled a little bit for me, you know. But I don't, I am, I like what they did and there wasn't a real... It spawned a lot of really incredibly craptastic imitators, and as much as it saved, quote unquote, saved horror, or brought horror back, it also kind of did it a disservice because everybody was like, "Oh, well, I know that formula. We should all go into the woods and or whatever and make <laughs> these movies." Um, I think the marketing was part of the best part of it because I knew people who were like, "No, you have like." these people did this. Like, they were convinced that this was a real thing. Um, I think that's brilliant. Um, I think for what they did, I, I think it's a cool idea. I think it's well executed for what it is. I really hate all the people in it. And if I knew them, I would be so annoyed. And I, there's a, I, I, I have such a low tolerance for just kind of ignorance or stupidity. Uh-huh. Like when I watch people, I'm just annoyed, like, Oh man, like you know, you hear about people who wander in the woods with just no plan and then they have people spend a lot of time and people get worried about them and other people have to spend tons of money, tax dollars yeah. going for people who, you know, I don't know. And so I watch this and I'm back to that and I'm just like obviously there's supernatural things going on, but I really these are people ill prepared. Um, in fact, even the people in Troll Hunter are better prepared. I mean, they've they've had time to think about it because Troll Hunter, you know, definitely came from this, you know, or was inspired by this, or however you want to call it. But uh, watching it again this time, I really don't have an interest in seeing it again. Um, although I have an immense amount of respect for the creators and kind of how they did it, and then how successful they were. Um, also. I would be fine if this movie didn't exist in just because it created a really terrible sequel that didn't need to exist in a lot of ways, in my opinion. But I don't know. It's successful. What what can you do, you know? Okay, well, that's a, that's a valiant salvo in the opposite direction. Drew, where are you going to come from? What are your opening thoughts, the things that pop into your mind as you watch this again? And if you want, you can tell us a little about where you were. Tony was staying up all night making video games. What were you, you know, tell us your first thoughts on that. Um, well, uh, I was in a bad, 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 bad place when this movie came out. It was only a, only a few months after my twin brother had been killed in a car accident. Uh, so this this was something that I was actually looking forward to as a as kind of a distraction uh, from that, even though it meant having to stand in a giant line and, all, all that. Um, I think, you know, going, going back to the, that particular point in, in time, um, we have to think a lot about where the horror genre was, which was, this was a few years after Scream had sort of reignited the slasher genre. So like, that's what we were Instead of the the endless copies of Blair Witch, we were we were then neck deep in endless copies of Scream. So this seemed really, really, really fresh and totally unique at the time. And uh, the only thing that I can I can compare that to is, you know, maybe showing somebody. Uh, die Hard for the first time, and then be then being completely ignorant of all the action movies that came out afterwards. Because Die Hard would just seem so so fresh at that yeah. point. Um, I'll totally agree with you there. Like the freshness and the atmosphere, like 
knocked out of the park, like at, at the yeah. time. Yeah. I yeah. I really like like the marketing for this. I love kind of the like all the stuff that they put out, the build up, the because you really learned more about the mythology from of of the Blair Witch from the supplementary stuff than you did in even this film. And I loved tell all of that stuff. Into that. Tell us, uh, tell, to somebody recap for me. Cause all well, I like A&E, A&E, A&E had like a, a special where they went into the history of this woman, Ellie Kedward, Kedward who becomes the Blair Witch. And, and it was done in like the stuff. Right? I mean, there is, there, there is no historical basis for the, sto- for the, no, it's the complete, movie. complete. Although the actors hogwash. did not know that going in, the actors thought that they were actually, uh, doing a movie about an, a real legend, and then they were just going to be. They didn't think the. You know, well, and I think that's the thing. I think that's the thing. The key when talking about whether this movie is scary or not. I do not find this movie scary when I'm watching it at home. I found it terrifying the four or five times I saw it in the theater. Yes, I saw it that many times because this is sort of like watching a filmed ghost story, like a campfire ghost story, and you need that group tension. And I could see it working at home if you have, like, a group of people who are all just riveted and, like, psyching yourself up to be scared. Uh, you well, know, it also it, works at home if your house makes weird noises while you're watching the movie. <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess. But, but I guess to me, as a home viewing experience, this, this lacks something that it, it – and it is, is a theater experience. <laughs> It, it's like watching watching a ghost story that's been filmed, and maybe that's why it didn't impact Tony the same way it did well, other people. Well, it's kind of funny because it's not a it's not supposed to ever be on a theater screen per se because it's all filmed. I, don't, with I, don't I guess have, well, no, I guess they have a film camera. Never mind. But uh, well, but yeah, I, I you know, I think that the nature of the footage is the nature of the footage is uh, it eventually. I guess eventually it becomes home video as we keep going through, you know, found footage, people tend to have video cameras or digital cameras or whatever. But uh, that's kind of funny. And, you know, it. I will have to say the first time I saw it, it was extremely creepy. Um, I think it was made more creepy by exactly what you're talking about, like the, the marketing of it and the mystique um, and the kind of word of mouth or the legendness of it in the you know, yeah. we li- we lived in a point where every single thing wasn't on the internet. So there was a kind of like, oh, it's on the internet. There's got to be a seed of truth, kind of feeling in a way. Like just to, just to there recap. wasn't as much of a Snopes kind of thing. Like, yeah. like well, maybe it's fake, but is it? You know, you kind of didn't know exactly. And I think well, that, I that, that added the same to that. Thing that was really good. Good. It had that kind of same thing that Texas Chainsaw has, where yes. it's like, oh, is this true? And, you know, Texas Chainsaw is not, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is not true, and neither is this. But, you know, I knew people that believed it, and, you know, it, you know, I didn't quite buy into that, but I thought it was cool that the idea that people... I loved the the the, the William Castleness of it is selling yeah. this as a true story. Yeah. Like that was well, amazing to me. Tucson of uh, from pretending, even as adults, just pretending for a moment that this is real. Just like these actors who are young adults are, you can tell that they are getting wrapped up in the pretending as well, because they know damn well that the noises going on outside their tent are noises being made by the producers for them to act off of. And yet even they are getting freaked out. You can tell that they're getting freaked out. There, there's, there's a, and, you know, so I think all of us are big boys and we understand that none of this is real. And yet at the same time that, you know, we can kind of like leave that at the door and, and kind of get into, oh, what if they're really, you know, it, it, it somehow, somehow it feels real. So, yeah, I also had friends going, is there any truth to that? Even though everybody knows darn well there's no way that there is. But yes, uh, also about the marketing, I remember, Julia, do you remember the lines at Dolby Theater? Like, it, yeah. it was huge. The lines would go, you know, out of the, away from the box office and then snake, like at Six Flags, all around the food court, people waiting to get in to see the Blair Witch Project. And, and this, at that time, this was just the one, the Dolby Theater, uh, that was the only place you could catch it, you know, in the, in the food court in the Dolby uh, dormitory at the University of Texas. And then, 
Um, I guess eventually it got to the multiplexes, although I never saw it on a multiplex. And, and this is one of the interesting things. People got pissed off about it when it got to the multiplex because somehow there was so much buzz around what a special experience it was going to these various independent, often fairly rinky-dink theaters to see this thing. And then when it gets to the multiplex, sometimes people felt like, like this didn't deserve to be in a multiplex. You know, like a $20,000 movie, it wasn't, somehow it wasn't right to spend eight bucks at an AMC theater and go see a $20,000 movie, I think. I mean, am I reading that wrong? That, that, was, that was sort of my take on what an inevitable back, backlash that happened to this film you know, months after it came out. Well, it was the most talked about movie of the year. I mean, like yeah. everybody was talking about this thing. The, the comic book store that I hung out at at the time was littered with Blair Witch merchandise. And some of it, you know, was people actually just making the damn twig men. And yeah. I remember Todd McFarlane made an action figure of the Blair Witch, which was then pulled because the filmmakers didn't want there to actually – be a visualization of what the Blair Witch looked like, which I think is I think is wise because I mean as much as Todd McFarlane's action figure is cool looking, like it's nothing's gonna be scarier than the 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 crone you'll dream up in your head. Oh absolutely. absolutely. Oh go ahead, Tony. Yeah. Um no I think that's I think that's true. Just the descriptions they give, it's so much scarier. Like whatever whatever that is that you're gonna conjure up, tons scarier um and they do and a they really never, good job though in those seeds clear. uh i you know what i i really do as much as it's not it never was my movie i i mean i gotta give it up it it appeals to everything urban legendy that you know and i would say perhaps it even paved the way for the ring in a major way like i don't know if we would have the ring per se without you know, without this, or was the ring ahead of time? Uh, well, I think it was a contemporary, but, but oh, yeah. it's possible that this would have opened up the market for daring independent films for sure. You know, yeah. uh, you know, because after somebody would watch something like this, the notion of going to back to the Dobie and catching a a new weird J horror thing or something like that, suddenly that world kind of feels a little bit more open. Um, I, or you know, getting remember, out, getting out, and making your own movie, like yeah. hey, these people oh, did sure. it. I mean, it spawned a lot of imitators that maybe weren't so great. But I mean, you know, Not if right getting away, people out there a, making stuff, that can't be. But I mean, when you think about that. it, Tony, there wasn't a lot of imitators. It's like this was so hard to do. I, I think sure. people could tell that not a lot of money was being spent. But in terms of just skill. This is a pretty skillfully made film, and and sure. we didn't see the takeoff of found footage movies for like ten years after this movie came out. That blows my mind. That like when you think about Paranormal Activity, that shit took like a decade. After. Yeah, but there was stuff after this. I I don't know, man. It, no, Paranormal was there was a lot of really bad imitations. Like well, I don't know, I, I don't know what scene I, that you like. I. I saw well, and heard of you may be right because I don't of this I, I terrible thing. have a tendency to watch like the first movie and something and then skip all the sequels and I certainly have not bothered to keep up with Gone Well definitely not and not even the sequel which is definitely not anything I man oh I wanted my time back from that but uh just you know I- imitation is the best form of flattery and there were a lot of people who missed maybe the point of like, hey, these guys did this, but we already have one of those, Yeah. you know? There were a lot of Blair Witch-esque, you know, this thing and this woods or this and this hidden thing. They were kind of just imitators. Um, All right, here's my And And that was kind of like, ah, uh, there were a lot of them. And it, it, I don't know. You know, again, like I said, kudos to people going out and making things like, that's that's a big thing. Uh, you know, I can't fault that. But uh, it did spawn a lot of like, hey, let's go into the woods with our friends and try to cash in on that money. Well, there were a lot of simple simple concept films that came around afterwards. And you could see people trying to come up with, like, and I think that was great. But, I mean, you know, like the one where people are adrift at sea and, and fending off sharks or the one where 
the three idiots are stuck on a ski lift. Uh, <laughs> which oh, yeah. I thought was brilliant. It's a film called Frozen, and it's the wrong movie to rent if you're looking for the other movie called Frozen. <laughs> one has this, more wool. Let it that's go. for sure. As a, as a, as oh, a, you yeah. know, that's oh, somebody should take "Let It Go," and there's a certain scene that you should <laughs> superimpose. Yeah. Oh man. Well, I gotta see if there's a mashup of that. That is a that, that is now a that has perfect way in more than the Disney animated feature. Or in the alternative, if only we knew an animator who could take the frozen characters and animate them to have to do the scene from <laughs> the stuck in the ski lift, <laughs> let it go. Oh, you just say put a little Anna on an <laughs> oh man, that would take a lot of work, but that would be freaking hilarious too. If anybody's yeah. out there, these are we're just throwing this. This is we're throwing out there because I just want to see is, this. This is Man of Heaven. Yes. This isn't. Uh, this isn't like Fire Shark, where you know, if Fire you make Shark it, I'm gonna awesome. be mad. Um, but this is. Yes, I would love to see either the song to a certain scene, and if anybody's seen the, you know, the yeah. stuck in the ski lift frozen. You will know that, or I would like to see the Frozen characters reproduced as the uh, horror movie feeling. Frozen. <laughs> you know, it, we, we had a we had a season no. past on ski resorts around here last year, and I thought about that movie all the time. I was thinking because you always try to like get, you know, as much skiing in in a given day, right? And, and try you're know, like, okay, they're gonna shut down the the lifts in, in eight minutes, so I think I can get one more run, you know. <laughs> And in that movie, what happens is the lift operator, if I recall, he, like, gets drunk and he gets he gets replaced with another lift operator who thinks the lifts are empty and he shuts them down and leaves those dumbasses up there. Okay, anyway. Which I'm sure anybody who actually operates a ski lift is probably like, they're like that would never this is happen. not how it works. So, witches. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, to get back to the Blair Witch Project, um, okay, here's my question, and this is related to this opening section we're doing on the marketing of this movie. I remember having a conversation with somebody who was lamenting that this was the way Hollywood would go from now on, that now that they've figured out how to make super cheap movies that just blew people's minds, the day of the big film was over. And I was like, mm, that doesn't make any sense at all. That, that, yeah, obviously we haven't <laughs> gone that direction. <laughs> well, I mean, you know. I will have to say that it did lead to have... TV. <laughs> like, TV certainly was like, yes. Yeah. This is right. <laughs> sure, rea- but, absolutely. Reality TV, which uh, you know happened, and maybe uh, maybe the growth of reality TV has something to do with this film. I I don't know. I'd have to look. Well, reality again. reality TV kind of was already a thing because MTV had uh, the real world. The real world. Yeah, the real world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it certainly like it didn't. It didn't. Film didn't turn all this way. But man, oh man, I could deal without reality. Yeah, I would no, I would not. have been a lot more interested in Survivor if there had been witches. Oh <laughs> hell yeah! The real you know, I think they did try a thing where they like kind of seeded it with like is this supernatural or not, but it didn't. Since everybody kind of knows, or, or is skeptic just skeptical enough. Well, and then but then you have like the ghost like the ghost hunter shows like the what is it the. Um, um, yeah. Ghost Hunter totally Ghost Hunters totally takes from this like any any of those shows. I, I can yeah. say we we can conclusively those would not exist without this. Yeah. Certain certain aspects like the rattling of the camera and the and the sort of flagrant use of day for, of like night vision and, and stuff like that that's unnerving to look at. And the and the sound effects of the actual people behind the camera just going yeah, you know, confusing. like the panting and the oh, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's that's something that's really what's good. amazing to me about this though is because it's been a while that I've seen it, but I've seen other found footage movies. They do they they do a lot of stuff that is that makes this better than its imitators. Like for example, they actually question the fact that they're there this this woman is still carrying the camera around and shooting stuff. And it yeah. makes it they act like it she's she's losing it for doing that. Well, they get into a big fight with about it and then then he set, he turns the camera on her and he goes, I see at one point, uh, Mike says, I see now why you like to to film everything. It's because it makes it less real. Like you just get to escape from reality when you're behind this. Yeah. yeah. yeah which which is better you know. than a lot of the, the, the movies that copy this yeah. Do they don't give you that that sort of explanation of of why you keep 
filming because it doesn't actually make sense that anybody would still do that. Uh, the other thing I think that this does that is a thousand times better than its imitators is they actually let you have a good look at everybody. You know, like all of the characters. There isn't just like one character that's stuck behind the camera the whole time and you never really get a good look at them. Like because you actually see all of these people, they feel weird. and I'm not weird, uh, uh, real. And when their lives go down this weird path and they're in peril, you actually, you're not so detached that you, there's zero emotion there, which is, I feel like, um, a lot let's of run down the people and the, and the technology they carry. Because, and the fact uh, that they are real. I mean, it really is real. Because you've got, so you've got the girl um, who is carrying her, well, you guys can tell you what specifically kind so of camera So Heather, is. there's Heather, and she's the girl, and she's the lead, and she's carrying a video camera. Just yeah, a, and just she's just documenting the, the making of the documentary. Basically. And the video camera has its own sound. And by the way, how grungy it looks just instantly transports me back to the 90s. I mean, it's amazing. Watching all, this, all these people in their flannel and their jeans and their chain smoking in the rain. And it's, you know, and it's, it, it, this thing is just like a time machine. It's really, really nuts, you know, especially the ugliness of video. Jeez. You know, okay. So, so then, one. so then you've got Josh. Um, Josh, who has the the dad, right? No, no, no. Josh he's got the camera. 16, he's got the Josh camera. has a silent, no oh, yeah, sound, yeah, yeah. sixteen millimeter. Uh, I can't remember if it's color or black and white. It's black and white. Okay, he has a he has a no sound, sixteen, 16 millimeter, millimeter black and white. Black camera. and white camera. And really he's solid. Got, and really he borrowed, he's borrowed that. He's got to get it back. And then the dad, the digital audio um, t- tape. Yep. is the sound recordings so that they have sound to go with the black and white camera. Right. And Mike's carrying that, and he's got to get that back as well. Um, right, because none of them are rich enough to have this equipment other than the, the camcorder that, uh, that Heather carries. Right. Anyway, but so, so the reason this thing seems so real and feels so real is because it's very real. I mean, they just they got these actors, but they didn't give them scripts. They just gave them, and they gave them the story, the legend, and they thought it was a real legend, so they sent them forth to interview people. They, the, the directors planted people, townspeople in the town to be interviewed without, they weren't actually tell, real. And sometimes the people just made stuff up, so okay. they were given stuff. And before we go into what they tell them about, because that is really what makes up Act 1, I want to take a moment here to recognize our sponsor, if you don't mind. Okay. All right. For you, the listeners of Castle of Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. We're very happy about the sponsor, and we're interested in what audiobooks our listeners recommend. This week's recommendation is from me. Uh, it is an audiobook from Audible that I loved, The Birds and Don't Look Now by Daphne de Maurier, read by Peter Capaldi. Okay, so this is two great horror stories one of which we have already done the movie version of on this show, The Birds, and the other that is a killer horror movie that we hopefully may get to one day, which is Don't Look Now, by Daphne de Maria, one of my favorite authors, read by the current doctor, Peter Capaldi. So that is my recommendation of the week. Not just random doctor. The doctor. The doctor of Doctor Who, yes. I'm just saying, Um, people might not know that. Former punk rocker (laughs) Peter Capaldi. Awesome Uh, speaking voice, too. Yes. Good for audio. he reads Death and Mario really well, too, because she has this sort of very modern kind of 1930s feel. It's, it's wonderful. He, he's great on it. Uh, anyway, you can try uh, The Birds and Don't Look Now or pick another audio book. To download your free audio book today, go to audibletrial.com slash horror. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash horror for your free audio book. Thank you. All right. Okay, so what I'm saying is that these guys are thrown into this situation where They've been given some general directions, and they're, they're going to have various drops at the points that they're supposed to reach, so they'll have more directions there. They get some food, but they're getting less food every day from the directors because the directors want them to get really pissed off at each other. And they don't know, like, they don't know what's going to happen, particularly um, whenever there's, like, scares. Like, uh, they wake up suddenly in the night. A lot of times it's just the directors, like, coming up, and, like, one time it's, they shook the tent or they'll be doing something else. And so it's, all this stuff is actually pretty real as far as them feeling really frustrated. They got lost several times. They don't, there's no camera crew. There's just the three of them. And they had walkie-talkies that they're communicating with the uh, production staff with. And um, they uh, would occasionally just get lost, and then they'd lose them for a couple of hours. And, and, and much so of the action of the film, 
the, much of the, the drama of the film is about these characters getting lost. Yeah. Now, Tony, you were saying this is the thing that bugs you the most about the movie, right? Is is there... Yeah, I mean, again, or, like, I just... I don't know. It's It's... I have very little, like, a lot of horror movies, not every horror movie, of course, but I have a hard time feeling sympathy for these people. <laughs> like, it's the... This, hey, we're going to go do this. They start out seeming like they're thinking about something. And, you know, plus, and it's been parried a bunch of times, the, the shot where the girl's starting to cry and she's really scared and, you know, things have gone crazy. And, you know, but the whole, like, a bunch of idiots in the woods fighting, like, for as long as they're arguing and being kind of jerks to each other and stuff. I just, again, the, you know, I didn't, see the it, I didn't see it in the theater, so I didn't see it with the crowd of people who were all kind of scared and, like, but, mm-hmm. you know, when when I think about camping or I think about going to do a project or whatever, the level of preparedness of these people was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, yeah. and, well, and they just, have that it never, about never, surviving in the woods, but they never look at it. Well, all of that. Like, a book isn't the same as having actual things that let you survive in the woods. Right. Like, well, yeah, you have a book. You know, it's why aren't there more fireproof it's matches or any well, number of... Well, I just think of the stuff I take when I'm camping. You know, I mean, I don't know how good it would do against a ghost or a witch, but no, well, bring them a, sh- a machete do. or an axe or something. No, but, if, yeah, you're right. They don't have a weapon. But I think they do okay otherwise because they do have water. They do have food. They do have a compass. They do have a map. They have the the the, the tent. It, the only thing is that, and they do have ways to make fire. But remember, they say that they don't want to do that anymore because they're attracting. They're being they're being bad harassed. Guys, ghosts, yeah. by something. Yeah, well, the but, thing the thing that, that that sends me over to siding somewhat with Tony is that he kicks the map into the river. That's yes. really petty. That's <laughs> really <laughs> goddamn stupid. And I, I. <laughs> You know, I, you know, I, I'm a big aficionado of the Friday the Thirteenth series, and I grew up in around the wood, in and around the woods. So I just think of, you know, two, both of those things. You're already in a a textbook horror setting, the yeah. woods, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like I, you know, I, if I were to go, you know, deep in country like the way they did, you know, I certainly would not be kicking my map. Like he's the one that really. Dooms them. Yeah, Mike, he's Mike the one that Christ really dooms them. I'm not sure. I kind of believe Mike, though, when he says, so you, you're absolutely right. But I think there's an extra. So so just as we've we've mentioned, there's really only two kinds of drama in this thing. There's the, the daytime stuff where they bitch about being lost. And then there's the nighttime stuff where something horrible is fucking with them in the woods. And it's able to follow them perfectly, even though they can't figure out where the heck they are. So that means to me there's uh, – this is not a stretch at all, all right? I know it's going to sound kooky, but this is a magical wood. They, that, they're, that map's not going to help them. Their compass yeah, isn't going to help cause them. Yeah, because they after walking south all day, they still come back to the same log. It's not, they didn't screw up. Either the compass is, not, is failing them for some reason, right. or the woods are changing. I think the implication may be because there's a time they go past the log and then they come back and it's the yeah. same log. Yeah. The, the, the woods are changing, but it. I will say this: it does kind of bother me that they never try to fight back. They are just so cowed, and I, 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 you know, this happens in a lot of horror films. This is certainly not the the only one that does it, but that's just not who I am. I don't care if it's like a ghost or a witch or whatever the hell this is. But how do you, how do you suppose they're supposed to fight back? I mean, it's not like they get physically attacked. I don't they know. They do do an impromptu well, exorcism. Well, one, of the legends, one of the legends is a guy who somehow kidnapped people. Like, and, But these are kids without the knowledge. So he got seven kids at one point yeah. somehow. Um, yeah, he so was even able to cunning or, or some, you know, or supernatural or well, something, the right? Seven, there's like so, the seven piles of rocks that represent those. Kids. The, the right. I'm, so finally fi- I'm finally finished, which is like one of the creepiest stories in the whole in the whole thing. Okay, and so what do we learn about that guy? So that, well, that's one of the stories that gets told in the in the town. Um, go ahead. 
telling and you. They, and they haven't, well, they also it ties back in. I mean, that part ties back in. That's the other thing is it's kind of confused on where it wants to head with that, and maybe that's part of the nature of it is this confusion. Well, the, 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 story, the, story, the, story, is, the story is back in the 40s, there was an old hermit who lived up in the woods, and they all thought he was really odd. And then, you know, during this one summer, all the kids started to go missing. Yep. And then one day, the guy comes down from the woods and says he's finally finished. Yes. And the uh, the police go up into to his house, and they find all these children dead, piled on one another. And a uh, uh, the guy confesses and says that there was a voice in the woods telling him to kill these kids. And the way he would do it is he couldn't bear one of them to watch him while he, he killed one of them. So he'd make one stand and look in the corner while he killed one of them, which is important because it gets repeated at the end of the movie. I'm wondering how he makes them do that. Yeah, well, he's magic. That's the thing. Yeah. He has the ability to control, to confuse. I think he's like the shadow, and he has the ability to cloud men's minds. And, and well, I think, I think he's. I think he's possessed by. The, I think he's possessed by the witch. I mean, yeah, right. he's, he's, I hearing, he's, he's, he's hearing a voice in the woods. I keep referring to them as the same thing, but you're right. There's the witch, and then there's the killer from the '40s who apparently was possessed of the witch, and there could be others. And uh, they and and the other. Let's see, the other stories they hear. They hear from this zany old lady. Uh, she talks about spotting a furry woman, a kind of a of a pan like woman in the woods, a horsewoman. And uh also she cairns, talked a little yeah. bit about the, the cairns, the, the stacks. Well it makes me it makes me think of the donkey lady, which is uh in uh I don't remember if that's in San Antonio or Houston, but it's a Texas folktale. With a, she has a donkey head or a donkey body? She's donkey like and she's covered in hair. And that's what yeah, that I mean, always that's... Does. That shows up in Nicaragua too. Weirdly enough, I, I can't remember what that lady's called, but yes, you know the, the horsehead lady. Um, the, it's this is a this is a common witchcraft motif for some crazy reason. Uh, and what other what other stories they they hear about apparitions? Oh, and there was one story of Coffin Rock. Oh, you talking about La Llorona? Oh, Coffin yeah, Rock I mean, is. I, I take that back. The Coffin Rock story is really creepy. <laughs> Coffin Rock yeah. is one where they come across three adults who have been tied, like, end to end and in sort of a circle, like a structure. You know, this is a, a like a books of blood kind of thing, where they come across seven people who have been tied together to form a structure, and the searchers who find it run back to get help, and when they return, all the bodies are gone. <laughs> that, that is a great story. But here's what's funny, is that, you know, you don't, I remember people just bitching, just like coming out and going, man, I didn't see anything and blah, blah, blah. But let me tell you, when they were in the movie, they were scared. You know, when those oh, yeah. stories were being told, Definitely. you know, and like, like they do this neat thing in this movie where, you know, people are like packing and getting out power bars and then it'll be a cut and then it's dark and they like woke up in the middle of the night and there's like fucking crazy noises going on outside their tent. And I'm scared. Everybody in the theater was scared. And I don't care what this macho jerk says in the lobby afterwards about how that was stupid, nothing but a bunch of rocks. They were scared. <laughs> the, you know, that that's amazing to me. When you because you've that, been mind. camping or you've been lost in the woods or you've been somewhere where you didn't have any control, yeah. and you know how that feels. You can put yourself in that position, and you don't need big special effects, and you don't need, you know, you know, like yeah. uh, ghosts coming out of screens or whatever. You just need the spookiness of it and feel, and putting yourself in that place, which you can in this situation because well, this of how really the well, I, it's really the opposite. Well, it's also, like I said, though, it's the, go, it's the campfire story aspect of it because yeah. Yeah. if you're scared into a moment, all, a lot of us will deny it later. Yeah. And I do think there is something about that group. It's almost like group hypnosis when you're in a big group of uh, – this is the one movie, I will say, like a lot of the times watching a horror movie is more frightening if you watch it by yourself, alone. Yeah. This is one a movie where it's the, the reverse. Like if you can just get a group of people who are transfixed by the, the, you know, the spookiness of this, you will all be scared out of your wits. You know, like, like whereas if I'm by myself, I will do what that guy is doing. I'll be like, 
well, there's nothing here. It's just a bunch of twigs. And, you know, people, yeah. you know, I, I mean, you know, it makes me sad. Like, even when I watch it by myself, it makes me sad at the very end where she's saying, you know, goodbye to her mom, knowing that she's going to go and die. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, but, you know, you'd have to have pretty low empathy not to to sure. react to that. But, um, there's like, one, so I have less empathy once I see them just, like, the way that they bicker amongst themselves. And I guess But they not bicker totally like around, normal. These just... aren't like assholes in a in a slasher movie where it's uh, like yeah, like cartoonish. These like people said, they, they bicker real. like that, normal that people. Is real. They actually yeah. made them like they do, it's not fake. I mean they actually got a really pissed off at each other. At one point she actually does bite the guy <laughs> because he's pissing her off. And it's like I mean they just they when you are I mean I know for you guys are all both married. You know that if you've been like yeah. without sleep or you're hungry or whatever, you re- snap at each other after just a few hours of like maybe you're a little bit hungry and you've been walking all day. Can you imagine in the woods and you're scared and you haven't bathed and it's just exhausting? Of course you're going to like there, – There's points where they're nice to each other. Like I really love all yeah. the stuff where they're talking about – like he's talking about, man, I really could go for – a warm piece of pumpkin pie with some melty, you know, some melty ice yeah. cream. I love the part where they're they're talking about that because that is real. Like when you're you're really hungry and <laughs> you start imagining, oh, if I could just have anything right now. And especially, you know, the the, the two characters because they don't, you know, for all they know, they're never going to have the things they enjoy ever again. So it's just like I, there's I a, really a point you see to that. Through, through most of it, I think they still figure that they're going to figure out it. Because as as Josh points out correctly, look, nothing is this isolated. You know, no matter where you are, I mean, all of them are well aware of this. All of them are educated. They're all like, look, if we keep walking in one direction, we'll hit a road. That's life. You know, short of running into a psychotic killer along the way, if we keep walking in one direction, we will reach a road. Except for the they, they keep walking and then eventually they hit Camp Crystal Lake. Yeah. Well, yeah. they're stuck. First of all, they're stuck in a Beckett play. I mean, for some reason, they're just literally stuck. Where you know, I, there's actually a moment that I think I know you could say it's exhaustion, but if there's where they've all just stopped, and Heather is going, can anybody explain to me why we've stopped? And I mean, it's supposed to be just they're exhausted and they're and they're just sort of everybody's rebelling against the fact they're going to keep trying to find the car. But I think there's also something magical going on. I think they just. I think they're just losing the ability to find out where the heck they're going. Um, okay, here's a question. Todd McFarley wanted to make an action figure, and we all know what that would have been like, you know, big, distended. Well, arms. you can find it nowadays on Google within, like, a minute or two. So here's my question, though. To me, Todd McFarlane or his, his interests move in sort of one direction of horror, a very sort of expressionist, grand guignol horror that is, is really out there and extreme. And then there's this other tradition that's sort of the, the Val Luton tradition of keeping stuff off screen. And it's interesting to me that that this movie is in a fine, long tradition of that, of not showing you things. Um, you know, and, and we've seen some other examples. We, didn't, we haven't watched Cat People on this show. But we've talked about Six Sense, which is very much the same way. Yeah, in this one, I, I've said, I think I said last time that I hated – when you don't see the thing. But in this one, I don't hate it because it's not, there's nothing that you don't know what it is. You just don't know who the killer is, but we wouldn't have known anyway because it's not going to, unless it's Josh, it's not going to be anybody that we know. So I would, I'm glad they don't show the killer. I'm glad they don't show it. You Did you just say unless it's Josh? Yeah, well, we, you said earlier that there's that, that theory that Josh is actually the killer at the end. There is such a theory. Yeah. Uh, there's all theory, kinds though. of crazy of course, theories he, about this movie. I mean, movie. he has to have pulled out his own teeth, but whatever. <laughs> he doesn't have to pull out his own tooth. He just has to come up with a tooth. To find some bloody teeth? That's that could be a – are you kidding me? That that tooth, that bloody tooth they find could belong to a badger. I mean, yeah. it's – No, it's, it's a person tooth. Well, it couldn't be a badger. It could be something else. Oh, no, there's, there's all kinds of crazy theories about this movie. That's one of the things yeah. that's kind of awesome about it is that the mythology – around it like i i uh, the one that i heard a million times was if if they just had not moved the rocks they would have been fine sure like it's really Uh, moving the rocks is what what, moving the rocks is what sent the witch over (laughs) yeah if there's some sort of biblical injunction again oh you mean the original the the rocks from the seven oh okay okay yeah when they find it when they find the cemetery 
and they move the rocks. That's what really uh, that, that's what really uh, doomed them. I don't, you know, I I think they're doomed from the in classic horror tradition. I think they're doomed from the start. Like I don't think I, you know, it's it's the it's the same it's the same rules of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You shouldn't stray too far off the beaten path because there's ogres, or in this case, witches. Here's why I don't think that it has to do with disturbing the rocks. Because night one, they just walk around, after, act, after a beautiful first act that involves being in a different world, an opening world where they're in the town, they go into the woods. Night one, they go to sleep. They wake up. Josh says he heard, he's heard cackling. That's before they find the cairns, the rocks. When they find the rocks the, that next day, um, yeah, they do knock one of them down, and they continue to get harassed. But later on when, when Mike goes, hey, listen, we didn't light a fire the first night and nothing happened, that's not true. Josh heard crap because he told them that. It's just that the other two were not disturbed by it. By the way, I'm shaking, not shaking, but I, I get shivers myself right now when I think of this business of they wake up in the middle of the night and they hear voices in the woods. It's just amazing when they step outside. Well, especially a, the creepy little children. <laughs> yeah, there's a point where they hear, hear children laughing outside their tent. The, there's a point where they step outside and, of course, they're looking around, and it means they've got lights on their camera, right? And they don't see anything, and they're just so terrified because what you can hear are, like, I don't know, maybe it's limbs snapping, maybe it's rocks dropping. You don't know what it's you're snapping hearing. Snapping sounds, yeah. And it's like, and, and it's, it is, I, I don't know, this movie was really good at, at this Well, and again, theater. because they don't know themselves what it is because the director is just messing with them. Right. Well, for most of the time, they think it's uh, they think it's a local messing with them. They they yeah. they don't they don't immediately. In fairness to them, they don't immediately go, oh well, obviously there's a real witch and she's she's. But like he says, like like Mike says, even if it is the locals messing with him, he doesn't want to play with that. That's, that's something I can <laughs> no, identify with. That's true. <laughs> Tony, you're from the country too. I I I totally could identify with the notion. Mike says very well. He goes, well, look. If there are locals who have come all the way out here to mess with, <laughs> to mess with us, I don't want to play with that. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I agree. They could, they could be animals because I don't want to play with that either. Right. Well, <laughs> but, um, I mean, uh, you're also on some much land. Like, yes. once you get deep enough, like it's not just, hey, why'd you cross my fence? It's you're on my land. I have the right in my mind to do whatever the hell I want at this moment. Yeah. Um, and whether the law is really on their side or not, that's the way that works. Yeah. Like, you know, that's, Shoot that's how, later. yeah, that's, that's the thing. So however that we, he's totally right. And, you know, in retrospect, like, well, like what you're talking about, like being in the woods and having scary stuff out there, that is truly scary, and that's why a lot of why, like I said, the atmosphere I think really works. And you also are right that you know, even amongst friends, if things are going stupid, you're gonna bicker. Like, yeah, that's just even if things aren't that stupid, it's just cranky. So I, I like know. that they make up too. You know, when they fight, it always cuts to the next thing where they've all just sort of gone. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, and then it's, it's kind of it's kind of cool. I recognize these people as my as my people, the overly pampered, overly technologized, college-educated, little in over their heads dumbasses. <laughs> yeah, I guess the you know the reason another reason why it didn't work for me as much is because, like, I don't know. I guess I don't like as effective as some of that is. I don't really give a crap about seeing a movie about, you know, this. In the same way, I don't often see movies about, like, hey, here's a movie about a terrible divorce. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, you know, this has true. Supernatural, which is different than that. But, or, you know, here's a drunk, you know, here's yeah. a drunk dad or, you know, wife beater or whatever. Like, I I can watch that on the news if I want. Like, I choose yeah, but you can to. watch anything that's in the movies on the news if you want. I mean, that's just a question of mm. what kind of movie. What kind of thing yes you like no. To the I mean, I, the last time there was a crazy kung fu battle with flying guillotines, I didn't see that in the news. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you have different tastes. When's the last time that there are trolls? <laughs> 
When's, right. when's, the, last time Godzilla, when's the last time Godzilla destroyed a city? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, hey, I hope. I'm like, talking, I was I thinking more along the lines happen, of drama. I was thinking more along the lines of dramas and suspense. But, but I, I, I hear your point. I mean, I do. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and and I agree. I tend to look for more extreme situations myself. It's why we do we do all this. So, okay, the next big crazy thing to come across um, is uh, when they come across the the voodoo symbols that are tied up with sticks. And at that point, there's still all three of the, of the searchers. You know, it, it first, the first weird thing was finding the stones and then hearing the weird noises and getting lost and getting loster. And then they come across a, an area with a whole bunch of voodoo art, basically, of these sticks that are tied together. Well, quick, with, quick men, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And they all sit down and they are... They, they film a lot. Heather really wants to get a lot of it on film because she's super excited. Either this is going to be related to her study of this local legend or it's just going to be really neat. She's documenting the whole thing because, as with a lot of documentarians, she doesn't really know what she's going to wind up with when she gets back to the studio. She hasn't talked about this, but this is what's going on. is, you know, hey, I'm going to take 30 hours of footage. When I get back, I'm going to put something together. You know, so finding this might be interesting. But they also get this sense that they're being watched because when they leave that, they go, okay, we're leaving, like really loud. Like, like in case you're watching us, we're not going to be here no more. Um, that's, yeah, I think that's, that's, I mean, if you, one can also surmise that they've seen Chainsaw Massacre. You know? Yes. <laughs> that they don't live in a vacuum and that, you know, especially once she starts finding things in the bundles. That oh. is scary. And if you, so the funny thing about that, that was is, realistic, that I mean, if you found yeah. that, that's time to to do whatever you can to make the compass work. So, so Tony, uh, uh, like I said, make a spear, but or something. That just like when they find the tooth, I'm like, you know, they don't know that it's a ghost, or you know, for sure at that point, you well, know, you know or it's horrible. What's happened to your friend? Because that's his. Turn, yeah, his make turn. a spear. So if someone tries to pull your teeth out, you stab the fucker. Make, yeah, make weapons. Yeah, yeah I agree. But, uh, <laughs> there would, be, there would have to be weapons. Do, like, like, I know, like, I'm not saying that I would 100% survive a horror movie, but I would go down swinging. Like, like if, if the Blair Witch comes after me, I'm going to poke a few holes in her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so let, me you, let me tell you about the, thing, but, the yeah. bundle. The bundle of sticks. Um, they put, you know, again, the the, direct, the production staff just puts it outside the outside the tent. So then they come out and they they find this, and so she tosses it because that's just what her instinct is to do. But of course, she needs to open it, so they had to, they had to communicate to her that she needed to go back and get it and open it. So yeah, she, it, was, yeah. it happened it happened so a lot funny. later. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. That this this bundle. That is so we know that something is tying things up. You know, so, but to Tony's point about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the voodoo tied together things. That was something that was in the Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, that was actually you're, you're right. You know, hanging on the porch, they had built like little little bone men. In that case, they'd taken you know human bones, chicken bones, whatever, to make these little things. And here, it's it's the same thing. The the whoever is doing this voodoo stuff in the woods has made little totems. And <laughs> from trees. My favorite line is Mike is sitting there looking at these things while while Heather uh, videos them. And, and Mike, you know, he's just sitting, you know, with his hands sort of on his knees, and he goes, "This isn't rednecks. No redneck is this creative." I thought that was the most brilliant line. Not true, by the way. There's plenty of creative rednecks, but that is a great line. It is it is so funny. And um, that's sort of when they decide, you know, we need to get out of here. But, yeah, soon thereafter, it's it's like the, the bad guys, whoever they are, keep trying to dare these kids not to believe that something really fucked up is happening. You know, so that by the time Josh disappears, they kind of try to convince themselves. Well, there's the one point where they wake up and there's slime all over Josh's backpack. Yeah. And that's kind of the indicator that he's – that he's, which I thought the slime, like that's like pushing, that's that's really like cementing this in supernatural because that's like pushing this in the, like Ghostbusters territory. Yes, ectoplasm, yeah. Of course, it was actually KY Jelly, so that's a whole another kind of movie. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, so ectoplasm and KY Jelly, which probably gets warmer when you blow on it. Which is yet another whole whole another movie. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm sure. Wow. 
<laughs> there is there is, there I think there is an actual it's like the erotic Blair Witch or the like there were several of those because there, there was a whole of course like, there is they the Blair some, Witch some, some who was it some thing I don't know if it's cracked somebody covered like here's all the uh you know all the triple X versions or at least risque versions of the movie after well after it was out. And uh, it was one of those, you know, ha-ha, this is... But there were more than a few. So there you go. How can there not be, I guess? So, uh, all right. Th- that really get- gets us to the final part of this, because, as we mentioned, one morning Josh has disappeared, and so we're left with just two characters, which is Heather and Mike. Mike the peacemaker, Heather the hard-driving leader. I mean, the, the you know, because Josh was always sort of the snarky... Um, second in command, almost. Josh, Mike, Josh to me, almost seemed like a, a a guy that had wandered in from Clerks. Yes, yes, and I love the way he talked. I love the fact that they call another man. I love that the, this is the most sexless trio that ever existed. There's no flirtation. There's no nothing between these people. Um, they're just all on a gig, you know, and 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 they're working on it. Honestly, I believe that a lot more in this case than I do any movie where people are out in the woods for four or five days and then they have sex. I'm like, really? That's just, ugh. Nobody's bathed. It's, like, prickly and hot. <laughs> it just never never feels like a particularly sexy yeah, place I mean, to any, me. Yeah, any sort of sexual assignation which were to happen here would seem out of place, honestly. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, I remember thinking that watching Lost. I was always like, no, guys. No. Lost was different. I mean, they were all clean <laughs> all the time. They're know. not, though. They're, they're in they're purgatory. Not. It keeps them clean. Well, that was, you find that later. Okay. Spoiler for Lost. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, okay. So, anyway, they wander. One night, they wake up, and they uh, this is the they, they hear Josh yelling one night. The next night, they wake up, they hear Josh yelling again. This time, they really feel like they can hone in on where they hear his yelling coming from. And the movie wraps up very quickly at this point because they follow that voice, and this time they come across a house in the woods that is one of the scariest fucking houses I've ever seen. It's this hideous, falling apart, two-story trap. It is just this this crappy, old, like, probably, I don't know, it, it, like fairly recent because it's a really shoddy house uh, in in the woods. At least this is the way that, that it appears. And I have no idea what this place was. I don't know if they built it from scratch to look like this or if it was actually an abandoned old house, you know, with, with busted sheetrock and all that stuff. But it's hideous, and they're following Josh's voice because Josh is yelling to them from inside the house, yell, yell, yell. They run up the stairs. And and here is some really interesting sound happens because Mike is carrying the now carrying Josh's 16 millimeter film and Heather is carrying the camcorder and so what that gives you is this really weird effect where um, oh no no I'm sorry I apologize Heather's carrying the the 16 mil and and what that means is because uh, Mike has the audio recorder her voice sounds at a distance from the video that we're looking at. So we're following her, but her voice sounds far away. And then as she comes closer to Mike, the sound sort of syncs up better with the image. It's, it's really wild, and it's a, it's a very disorienting, very cool effect that's going on here. You know, and that's another thing from found footage. I don't remember that kind of bonkers, like, just playing around with the te- technology. I don't remember seeing it very much, that, that, that kind of, of technical confusion going on. Well... Um, other people just didn't do it as well a lot of times. Like, I, I, mean, I guess the fact that they did the sound design, like that's one of the other parts that when they spawned crappy uh, wannabes, like that's what makes it a crappy wannabe is it's not as nearly as technically proficient. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. like, oh, there's no like sound design taken into account. The ones who do it well, it's, it's really cool. Um, yeah. The ones who did it poorly just left the, mic on on the video camera and that was that you know right so right and then you would have gotten two you would have gotten two sounds of her yelling yeah so they've thought really carefully about how this is going to work you know with the the sound coming from from far off 
And oh, so and there's also uh, the little handprints on the the wall. Yes, yes. Drew, do you want to? Who wants to walk us through the 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 final the final bits of the? Well, I think that should be show. Julia. This was her Julia? was her show. Tell us what happens with Heather. Uh, as she as she continues to try to follow Mike around, who's chasing after Josh in the shop. Right. So we've heard Josh yelling. Um, for, uh, uh, and so they fo- they're following the sound of his voice, and they run in. They find this house, and they go in, and they're hearing his voice, and um, and it's uh, it's actually done with. The, they just recorded his voice. The, the production people just kind of place the, t- the tape players around the area <laughs> so they really have no idea where his voice is coming from but they're following they're trying to find it and so they're running up the stairs at this like you said dilapidated house and as you said there's all these little little hand prints all over the wall you can't tell if it's you know paint or blood or what it is or just dirt but it's all these little hand prints and they seem to be child sized um all along the walls as you go up the stairs and it's just you know creepy but nothing nothing particularly you know, there's nothing in particular that's creepy. It's just creepy. So they go upstairs. They don't find anything there. They go back down. He, so she's chasing him constantly, and Mike's always ahead of her. And um, and then Mike finally, they go downstairs, and she enters the room where, where well, no, I'm sorry. So then you're, you have Mike's perspective, who, like, again, is holding now that he's holding the camcorder. Mike's perspective as he just gets knocked out. And he's, so it's just the camera just flies to the floor and we're just we're just on the floor now so then and you can now you follow her as she tries to find him and she goes into this room and now i'm guessing it's mike because it's not, i don't think it's josh right it's, I think mike. it's mike it's mike is now standing against the wall like facing the wall and she gets knocked out and and then the camera that camera's on the floor and we have no idea what happened after that yeah. so except for that they were never found <laughs> so there's they're pretty pretty certainly dead. Yeah. And it is it's it, it is really really scary. I mean, I found myself not quite as devastated here as I was at the end of some other movies where the main characters get killed. I think because you're so certain that they're dead yeah. already. Well, because they tell you at the beginning. Yeah, that's this, right. This, this God, found that's a year true. after they went missing. Yeah, yeah. You don't you, because it says at the beginning that they're. You're right. You know, maybe if they had left that out, there'd be even some question as to whether they're going to get away. Would you want to make it out? Yeah, right. It's mm, a good question. You know, there's another thing that the that the filmmakers did is they showed this whole film that piece where you know Mike is turned to the corner and so forth. And so when it was shown at Cannes, this is the film. But one piece that was not in that version of the movie was the guy with the baseball cap back in Act One, who says, "Oh yeah, the." the old guy would turn one of them to the wall so that he would kill the other because he didn't want the eyes on them. That interview was not in the version that people saw at Cannes, and it caused them to complain in the you know stuff they when they were interviewed. They said, I didn't get why Mike was turned around. And this was one where the directors decided that rather than be really obscure, weird, or symbolic or anything, that they had an idea in mind, and so they went ahead and put that legend in so that it would pay off at the end. And it, um, and that works really well. It worked for me, you know, totally works for me. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the instant, you remember that story. Um, and I don't know what I would have made of, made of it if, if I had just been given this image of Mike turned to the wall without having heard the story in the beginning. I think it would be a totally different feel. So <laughs> that's... <laughs> That's the Blair Witch. Uh, what else? I'm trying to think of it, if there's anything that we haven't well, hit a point. Since we'll never do the sequel, and I watched it for research, I would like to, to chime in about that. And I took note, Tony absolutely hates that movie. And I don't think it's very good. Um, but I do think it's interesting, considering the scores of imitators this movie has, that when they came time to do a sequel, they opted not to do... Yeah. They found footage movie at all, which yeah, actually makes me give them a little, little. Even though I think it's a terrible movie, I, that makes me give them a little bump up because at least that they were they were thinking outside of their own little, their own little cigar box. Is as far as what they were saying. I mean, do you think this is too damn hard? And they were like, we're not doing. No, it well, I actually think it's lack of laziness because they tried to do something different, which was comment on their own fan base. Unfortunately, you know, they didn't end up really saying anything interesting, 
about their fan base. But that's what they were clearly trying to do was was you know show kind of a snapshot of of horror fandom at at the at the time that Blair Witch came out. Um, no, I actually think that that's a, a thousand times less lazy than doing you know a, another. It, it didn't result in a quality film, but it's it's. I, I said it gives, I give them a slight bump up for trying to do something a little a little meta and a little a little different than than what they what they could have done. What they could have done what Paranormal Activity does, which is you want to make a, a movie. movie. Just make the same damn movie once a year for the next ten years until until people stop paying. For and there's you know that's an approach. I mean that's essentially what most slasher movie franchises sure. do, but those those have the very thing that we've been talking about, the fact that you never actually see the witch, you would have to do that to, to yeah. turn this into a real franchise. Um, yeah. Because like to, to, to have a true horror franchise, you need the sort of charismatic villain to hang the, yeah. the series on, which, you know, you, you would have to see the witch. And I, it would sort of rob it of its power. It's funny. I actually, before we, when we were gearing up to do this, I had imagined that there was a Blair Witch Three, and I, I what I was really remembering was the terrible video games. But uh, uh, in my mind, I was like, oh yeah, there's like a third Blair Witch, and then I went to Vulcan Video. No, there's not a third Blair Witch. Huh? Yeah. No. Well, and and I had read that. As late as 2009, supposedly they were still thinking of it. Now, uh, this movie came out, you know, going on, you know, over 15 years ago. That's uh, if if it were produced by Sony, you'd have at least one reboot by now of a new a new Blair Witch. Uh, it would be almost kind of a moot point because there are so many imitators of varying uh, levels of, of Boy, quality and ingenuity. Or that's that's terrible to think of, but it's totally true. It's like, you know, could they, like, I love Case Carpetta novels, right? The, the Patricia Cornwell novels about the medical examiner, and they're wonderful. But the fact is, when they began, it would have been great to make a movie because who ever heard of a medical examiner solving, solving crimes? But now, after CSI, it would seem like a CSI ripoff. And well, kind of, I mean, there's a couple of things. Well, I mean, dude, you and I have encountered that. We made a yes. steampunk book when there wasn't any steampunk. Yes. And then when by the time it freaking came out, over a decade later, after we'd written it, people were like, oh, it's like that steampunk crap that I've been yes. seeing way too much of. Oh, and it's like Steam Boy. We're like, oh, we made this before Steam Boy. We made this before people just put gears on a hat and called that cosplay. You know, no offense right. to people who really do the, the real deal stuff, but it's reached a point. I mean, there was a Justin Bieber steampunk video like wow. you know the, the <laughs> for better or worse in the community it's a thing that's kind of like you know once once a popular pop icon is taking note you know if you're a new thing you kind of run into maybe being an author ran but also so like by the time there's so many of these things it's like it's like an urban legend that's been told like part of the build-up was could this be real by the time we're yeah. dated enough, it's like having your uncle start off and telling you, like, hey, there was a scary guy and some people. And then one of the kids turns to him at the campfire and goes, oh, did he have a hook? I bet he had a right. hook. Tell us more about this guy who has a hook. I heard this when I was three. You know? <laughs> like, And, and so that, that leads you to wonder. Is that person 13 that you're talking about? Right. Cause we have Probably. One. But you know what I mean? You know exactly <laughs> what I mean then. Like, by the time you've seen enough of these, you're kind of yeah. like, I mean, by the time we come to one of my least favorite of all of them, uh, Poughkeepsie tapes, you're kind of like, okay, I guess this is where we're taking this. Yawn. Well, the question yeah. is, can you get into it? I mean, I'm fine with somebody going, oh, man, this is just a James Bond ripoff. If I end up getting into it and it's an exciting movie, I'm all right. So the question is, if there were a horror movie and you got into it and – and, you know, once I'm past the initial whatever kind of riffing this is, to go, okay, I'm into it now. You know, I, I loved Hunting in Connecticut, but a lot of people felt that that was a ridiculous ripoff of the Amityville Horror. But once I was in it, I felt scared. Um, oh, yeah. I, 
And no, you know, I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm a hypocrite too because there's well, they were even talking one, right? about. I, I've I've made more than one uh, Jason Voorhees reference on on this podcast because we're talking about a horror movie that takes place in the woods. They were talking about doing a found footage Friday the 13th movie. Um, I would be kind of against that because I think, you know, to be properly Friday the 13th, it has to be this sort of EC comics, you know, gleeful ghoulishness about it. And, and find found footage works best when it's a little, little more subtle. Um, but I get why they would think that. Cause you look at this movie and you see the atmosphericness of it and what can be done with, you know, the woods is an ominous thing. So I, I get it. Um, I'm glad that that movie's not going to end up happening now because that would just, you know, as a yeah. fan of the series, that's not what I, that's not what I want. That's just not what that's for. I mean, in the same sense that, that, you know, um, the, Oh wow, we have a lot of comments in the chat room. Um it's it's just not what it's for, you know, like you Friday the 13th, at least later on, you really want to see that Savini artistry. And in this case, you know, this is this is more along that that uh, cat people sort of line of just creating a a frisson. So, um Tony, what are they asking about in the chat room? We have we um have we're talking about the ambiguity of everything at the end. Yes. And was it supposed to be ambiguous, or did it just fizzle out? And I think it's purposely ambiguous. There, there um, are several things that are. I mean, another was uh, in the bundle with the tooth. There's something else in there that she just goes, yeah, and she throws it away real fast. So there's a lot of blood. There's a blood. His hair. There's his hair. Yes, and something that looks like it might be a tongue. But it's probably not a tongue because we hear Josh yelling later. Um, if that's Josh. Yes, it was Josh. It could be Josh, just recordings of Josh from earlier, too. It could just be a demon making Josh sounds. Yeah. I mean, this is yep. Man, magic. demon, you're jumping up. We have ghosts and witches. You're jumping all the way into demons. Man. Dude. Well, <laughs> you're, exactly, you're exactly right. It could be a witch. But the, look, when you have a witch, that's a lich. And when you have, like, an immortal witch, it's basically a demon. This sounds like a song. This sounds like something that should be in a... In a this is, a, this is a, the, the best song Rocky Erickson never wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I I am down with that. So, um, all right. We should, uh, we should probably get our final thoughts about the Blair Witch Project and then go on to endorsements. So uh, I think we started with Julia. Mm -hmm. Julia, do you have any final thoughts for us on the Blair... I know that we probably could talk about more... Um, and uh, so it, we're we're happy to keep talking about it on the on the Facebook page if if there's stuff that we just failed to comment on. If so, I yeah, I, I feel like um, the things that there are to complain about in this film are things that there are to complain about in life. I don't think it's stuff about the making of the film. I think it's like when we talk about you know the people are idiots. Why did he kick them? Yeah, you know, people do stupid shit, especially like I said when they're mad and they're tired and they're just delirious and they're hungry and whatever you know, dehydrated. It's like you don't think rationally. So I think when we complain about the things, the choices they make, I really feel like that's all you can tell. I mean, you see the news stories constantly. People dying, like, you know, people, this, this, this couple died a mile into their hike in the sand dunes because I guess they fell or something and they didn't have enough water, so they gave their water to their kid and the kid survived. And you, you can read that and be all judgmental if you want because you might have made different decisions. But the fact is it happens in real life to real people and they didn't mean Oh, yeah, well, when in yeah. Hawaii there was a guy who was, like, lost, and he was, I think he was from Austin. And I kept, we were at the area, my wife and I were around the area where he got lost. And, you know, things happen and you get delirious and, you know, yeah. I can understand. However, I do know that no matter which way you walked, there was only one way he could have walked. And if you looked at the sun, you could tell which direction it's moving. That but wouldn't again, lead to the freaking ocean. Just, you just but, don't know. <laughs> but it wouldn't lead to the stupid ocean. So yes. Um, I was, you know, <laughs> but people do these things. It happens. It may be stupid, but it still happens. So I don't think it's a flaw in the filmmaking. I think it's a flaw in humanity. <laughs> and so, but the, um, I think it's just a brilliantly made film, and I think it's just um, so original, given that it was, you know, the first one of its kind. 
and um, I'm just delighted that it exists and that it, uh, even if it did spawn some awful things, but it spawned some great things too. And I think it's that's awesome. And uh, I was thinking when we were talking about the reality TV, it's actually Survivor and those kind of things that also are probably. No, a of lot. course, of course. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, by the way, Tony. Uh, tattered flag in the chat room said that in the UK it was released and people were and Tony Blair was the prime minister. People were like, "What's this witch project?" With Blair. <laughs> <laughs> that is rich. That is really good. Thanks for that story, by the way. Of the that's League of extraordinary awesome. gentlemen. <laughs> that's just yeah. awesome. What does this have to do so, with our prime Sophia minister? That's it, great. Sophia called it the Blair Witch Program, and her friend was like. Project. It's project. That's Blair. You're right. That'd be cool. The Blair Witch Project and like the Bush Troll Program. <laughs> nice. That would be awesome. That's I would have liked George W. Bush a lot better if he'd had a bunch of trolls. So, anyway, go ahead. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Your actual uh, so final, my final thoughts. thoughts. Like, oh, okay. um, I, you know, I don't ever really have to see this movie again. I think that they did a, they did a lot of cool things that weren't being done. They've also, there's a whole backlash because people go, well, I could have done that. Yeah, but yeah. you didn't. You know, I mean, that's with anything, right? Like, you can, <laughs> sure. we can all say that and we're all mad at each, that, for, that we didn't make Blair Witch money. Um, you know, we spend this much and then you get this much back. Like, got, that, a lot of that's good. hindsight. Um, I think they really did set up the atmosphere. Um, it's not their fault that everybody thought, hey, this is, you know, this is what we should do and made a lot of, you know, maybe not as great imitators. Again, you know, there are good ones. I, I was totally done with this genre um, a couple of years ago. And then there's one, I don't know if we're going to cover it or not, but there was a movie that, you know, was recommended to me and I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to get this stupid time footage movie, but it actually turned out really well. Like I really enjoyed it way more than I thought. And then Troll Hunter, the same thing. I was done. And then I was like, oh, well, Trolls, maybe that's different. And I really enjoy that movie. So I guess there's room for, you know, good things, uh, a good version of something. Uh, it didn't, this movie didn't work as well for me as it did for my friends. And I think it probably goes back to what you were talking about, where alone maybe doesn't work as well. Plus, I'd kind of heard the hype and I was, okay, you know, it's going to be this thing. Um, it is what it is, but I, you know, I can't fault the, the filmmakers. A lot of that's more on me than it is them. Um, as far as being this savior of, you know, bringing horror back around, uh, it's the same to me as Scream. Like it did and it didn't. Um, there's always some new quote unquote savior of horror, but in reality, it's the same thing that people proclaim rock and roll is dead ever so often. And it, you know, and then whatever. it comes back. Yeah, it's, new it's not even rock. dead. It's, it, it wasn't even dead. It's just it's usually a piece to promote some new thing that they're into. Rock and roll yeah. is dead, but have you listened to this other band? You, right. Whatever. You know. But uh, you know, I'm glad we covered it. It definitely isn't my favorite genre of film. So uh, I don't know about the rest. That's of the series, all told, Tony. But, that's uh, pretty positive for for. A genre that that you that is not one of your favorites. I mean, I think well, a, I mean, this is we're seeing the the beginning of it, and you know, I'm, you know, yeah. I, like I said, I think a lot of the backlash is, well, I could have done that, you know, great, yeah, you know, we all kick <laughs> ourselves for that, you know. I, I think that's true. <laughs> well, I mean, this movie made it to the Guinness Book of World Records for most for the biggest um, ratio. Of money spent to money made, <laughs> because it yeah, made fantastic. yeah, Get it made uh, eleven. They made like eleven thousand dollars per dollar spent, basically. That's no man. Get, again, get what you can. Like as yeah. an artist or or you know. A per, well, I wonder how much the actors artists, got. Though. Like, I don't know the first thing about how the actors were treated. I promise we'll come back next week, and if we have that information, we'll share it. Um, Drew, final thoughts. Blair Witch Project. You know, I, I echoing Tony's comment about Scream, you know, as somebody that was a, li- a little bit younger than the rest of y'all when this came out, I did enjoy this movie quite a bit. I don't think it had quite as profound uh, effect on me as the first time I saw Scream, kind of like thinking of two the two benchmarks, sort of benchmarks of 90s horror 
you know, I think that th- th- those two movies would be, uh, you know, but this definitely seemed fresh at the time because, you know, we, we had been, been at this point uh, gone on to like urban legend and, you know, we were on our, our second or third. I know what you did last summer by the time this, this came out. So this, this seemed like something different in that did make, you know, this was, this was everybody in my friend group was, was stoked to, to see this when this came out. I, I you know, I, and it's, it's hard to put people in that, that frame of mind, but like this was, this was talked about all summer long the way I'd imagined like the, the exorcist might've been talked about when it was, new you know just it and it's been a long time i think that i've seen a horror movie that's had that much hype around it you know like you know there aren't really horror movies that are quote-unquote summer movies anymore you know like the the way this was you know and you know the, the the blockbuster style of filmmaking you know this was released Dear, you know, during during the hot months of the year, but it was, you know, it's a low budget movie, and that's that's also one of the things that's great. You know, I love it anytime um, an independent thing makes money because it's, you know, speaking personally, it's so goddamn hard out there <laughs> to compete yeah. with big corporate money. So like hats off to to these guys for doing something on a shoestring and and kind of spitting in the eye of the the Hollywood machine because I think that's awesome. Yeah, how it's manipulated later has nothing to do with the fact that they got out there and did it. Yeah, yeah. when other people weren't. That's like, a good point. That is, you can, that is a really, you really good point. Look at it and whatever, but also the 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 smarts to. Uh, you know, promote it the way they did online and everything like that. Like, um, that, you know, that is the reason we're still talking about it too. When we're not talking about as many of the also rans, that's a, that also is a big deal. So while it may not be my favorite thing, you know, I'm with you on, they got out there and did it. And that's, that's the biggest step, you know? And I, I still feel that it's, you know, it's very effective. I found myself feeling scared. Uh, I I really could identify. I was freaked out by the images of the trees. I, I was I was really having a good time watching this movie. So it, it it worked great for me, and it also really just took me straight back to the '90s. It felt like right up there with Before Sunrise, as far as being just a, a just a time transporting film. Oh, well, this this movie actually makes me think a lot of Clerks, and maybe it's because they're they're the the grunginess that you're talking about, but also the the general age group on display here. For sure. Oh, absolutely. You know, and this is more or less my generation. I mean, uh, you know, Heather Donahue was born in something like '67 or whatever. I mean, she's like, she's, you know, these the these people are more or less the age of the people I was hanging out with when I watched this movie. So it felt like a bunch of you know, my friends going out into into the woods. And One thing know. I wanted to say, funny, that you reminded me about the fact that, because I was thinking, well, they're younger than we were because they're, I mean, the characters are because they're in college, but maybe they're, they might be mastered, they might be getting mastered, but I think they're in college. Uh-huh. Uh, so they're oh, really Jamie, for, for, what, for what it's worth, the uh, the age groups in Hollywood are always fudged. Jamie, Jamie was just offered a role in a movie where she'd be playing someone uh, who's, who's 25. So, I mean, Great. that's just the way it goes. So, hey, well, how old is she? Uh, she is 32. 25. Oh, really? See, I would have bought her for 25. Um, well, you know, I mean, Hollywood 25. <laughs> Heather, Heather Donahue was born in 74. I'm sorry. She wasn't yeah, born I was going to say, she seemed younger than us. But, um, so, but uh, I was going to say that um, I loved, I forgot to say this earlier, I loved how Heather would adopt this persona whenever she was doing her little narration. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was brilliant. <laughs> me when she's setting up for her, and that's where you realize you really know this girl. She wants to make a cool documentary like you would see on PBS, which is probably something she's been watching since she was a precocious seven-year-old. And she makes, she puts on this sort of, this sort of snooty, you know, documentary host voice as she stands in front of the cemetery. Here at Coffin you know, Rock. 
<laughs> it's so well observed. And she's like, she, she articulates more, you know. She just gets oh, really, like, her English gets perfect. I totally could identify with where this girl was coming from, the fact that she probably knew that that was bullshit and also couldn't stop herself. Like, that was how you're supposed to be if you're doing a documentary. Uh, it it That was just really pleasing to, to see that. Um, it tells you so much about that character right then. Uh, yeah. Let's get our our, um, our endorsements this week. Uh, if you have anything to endorse that you've been wanting to share with people. So, Tony, anything that, that – uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. We totally started with Julia. Julia, you can anything start, you can start you with Tony. I'll, I'll, think, I'll see if I can think of something. Oh, okay. Well, Tony, we're back to you. I've, <laughs> I've been having – well, A, one of the biggest episodes that I actually – the tech team had, like – it was a a lot of work, <laughs> and a lot of work for all the team. Uh, the biggest episode for Red vs. Blue just came out, uh, episode 18. Um, and again, this podcast has nothing to do with Rooster Teeth other than I work there. Um, I have to say that. <laughs> I happen to work there. This podcast <laughs> is not affiliated with them. But uh, the biggest thing that, it, that we worked on, episode 18 came out, and it's it's pretty fantastic. I will have to say that the whole team pulled together, and it looks pretty amazing. I was stoked watching it again, and I've seen it a lot because I had to work on it, which was something else for the tech team. Um, part of why I wasn't on the podcast for a while <laughs> was this was one of the episodes. Um, but it turned out pretty awesome. I also have a really – like I want to endorse it, and I'm also like on the fence. Um, I caught the first two seasons of Hannibal, and I thought mm. there's a lot I liked. There's also a lot I was not as thrilled with, but it's really well shot and well acted. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We could do a whole thing on that show, but like, you know, I I recommend it for a lot of reasons. I also there's a lot of I have a decent amount of problems, but you know, it was I think a lot of that's just more on how I few things but uh it was done a lot better than I, I thought it was and you know a cabillion times better than the was it Hannibal Rising was that the prequel movie which was the, not good yes in my like that's I really like that's another one I wanted to like I wanted my time back like I really just want him <laughs> I wanted somebody to have to have paid me after I saw it for watching that I think I read um, that book for what it's worth. Uh, man <laughs> That was a rough one, and I feel really bad because uh, also I feel I feel kind of bad now, like when I do bad mouth things because somebody, the show I'm working on now, Ruby, um, yeah. some people I saw a, it was not a video, it was just an audio podcast, um, YouTube video where some people, three guys, just, man, they laid into it, and I know some of the history, I can understand some of their points, but uh. I'm trying to be a more positive person in general because after listening to that, I was pretty angry that people who I haven't seen any of their work just, I mean, it was brutal and snarky because snark doesn't, snark doesn't equal critique regardless of what people tend to think these days. And so I'm trying to stay more positive. But um, I think that's after well after that, like, because, man, it was... It was brutal, and I know why the show is what it was, especially in the first season. And so, you know, again, going back to people putting it out there, I, I don't know. I don't know if that maybe that will make less interesting uh, podcasts in the future as I <laughs> possibly hedge what I say, but um, that's part of my philosophy now. <laughs> it's, well, you know, I, well, I've don't be snarky jerks. Time. Like, don't be snarky jerks. Like, have some like actual critique other than well criticism criticism is an art form you know it's not just pointing out what you don't like it's you have to be able to not just look at a film that you like and and point out the things that you like about it you have to look point out the things that you don't like about it but also look at a film that you don't like and find the positives in there and a lot of people forget that well also like you know it went into like personal attacks on like well, so and so did this. Pfft, of course they did. Like that. Screw that. That I don't know. Anyway, that's a different 
sorry. But yeah, I like I said, I have a a double edged sword on Hannibal, but I think the positives outweigh any negatives I personally had and it is really although it is super brutal, going back to what we said, like, hey, you know, I can see, hear hear things on T V and stuff like that. Like this this definitely pushed some of my buttons as far as like ooh, I I don't know if I'm down with this the way that this gore plays out. Um, I'm surprised they said it was on NBC. Like, yes. oof. I don't know how they showed that unless the the version on Amazon is uncut. Because well, it's, I've, I've been it's shocked pretty horrific. at the rising level of gore on network TV for a number of years. Because I mean, remember, CSI can get away with a shitload. I yeah, mean, it's, it's horrific in a way I was not expecting huh. at all. Um, that was surprising. Wow. Well, there you go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Julia, do you have anything to endorse? I don't know. I can't really think of anything um, that's been particularly... I, mean, I don't even remember. I don't know. I think I feel like the, the weeks are just kind of... I can think of one thing that you probably will want to talk oh, about. Yeah? We were watching the new series from uh, Bill Hader and um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the problem is I can't say what I want to say without spoiling it, so I just got to leave it as as documentary now is awesome, and you should check it out. But I can't say what I would want to say without totally spoiling the episode. In fact, I, I think you should leave about. it there. Yeah. It is yeah. Awesome. So uh, yeah, yes. just just documentary now. Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks for yeah. reminding me. Okay. <laughs> did you have anything to endorse? Yes, I do. Uh, there was a sale on Comicsology this week for uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and I picked up all three part of Alan Moore, Alan Moore's Nemo trilogy, which is set in the universe of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but follows Captain Nemo's daughter, who also happens to be Pirate Ginny from the Three uh, Three Penny Opera. Oh, uh, and it, it's it's three particular comics, and it uh, it takes place over. There's the first one, which is, involves uh, them taking the Nautilus to the South Pole and dealing with uh, lo- things of a Lovecraftian nature. There is the second one, which takes place during World War II, but instead of uh, Hitler, uh, we we have uh, Charlie Chaplin's character from The Great Dictator and uh, right. his council, which is made up of characters from uh, different impressionist German films like uh, like Berlin's been designed by Rotwang from mm. Metropolis and Dr. Caligari has his, his uh, sleep SS shock troops and uh, then the third one uh, takes place in the Amazon, which is a mashup of it has, you know, elements of Creature from the Black Lagoon, the Lost World, but most importantly, we have uh, Doctor Goldfoot as the bad guy who is uh, creating uh, Nazi Nazi robots in in the Amazon, Nazi robot women in the Amazon rainforest. That sounds so, fantastic. Um, I loved this series. I I did not care for for the adjacent series as much, which was was Century, which was the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen in the 20th Century. But I thought this was closer in style and tone to the two preceding graphic novels, and it was just so much fun. The art is great. I, you know, there are so many references to different things, and I, you know, I had to get immediately you know, start Googling the stuff I didn't, I didn't get, but there was a ton of stuff that I, I did. And, uh, you know, essentially, you know, creating this whole Captain Nemo dynasty that, that, that Alan Moore has, just it, that, you know, adds this other, you know, this element of like a legacy superhero, you know, that we've seen a lot in, 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 uh, DC comics is that there's always, always must be a, uh, Captain Nemo raiding the the seas, and I, I think that that's that's kind of an awesome idea. And you know, I, I it was one of those things that after reading it, I just immediately felt charged up, like I really wanted to write my, something myself because it's yeah. so weird and so crazy, and and so uh, 
wonderful. And I, I, the cell is not going on anymore, but I would say it is totally worth it at full price if you like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or, uh, you know, 10,000 Leagues Under the, the Sea or, you know, just, you know, anything lo- along those lines, I think you would get a, uh, a kick out of. I also should plug uh, Jamie's show uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, they're playing at the Gypsy Lounge. It's an early show. The show starts at 6. And they're going to be playing with the, the Frantic Flintstones, which is a legendary English psychobilly band. So they are they're very, very lucky to to get on this bill. And it, it's got a lot of local uh, rockabilly and psychobilly bands are on this bill. But it's, it's kind of like the creme de la creme of local bands as far as that genre goes. And I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Like I said, that's the Gypsy Lounge this Sunday if you're in Austin. You should come by. The show starts at six. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Uh, all right, my endorsement actually this week, and, it, and it's hard to choose something, but I just got this amazing book. First of all, Julie and I went to uh, to an exhibit at the Colorado History Museum that was dedicated to toys of the '50s, '60s, and '70s, and they were showing a lot of things like these these amazing Aurora model kits. And, uh, you know, things dedicated to that was monster, so great. in the monster craze. So that's another uh, endorsement on the way, which is if you're in Denver before October, before late in October, uh, then um, uh, you should stop by the Colorado History Museum and see the toy exhibit. It's really, really cool. But anyway, I, got, I was interested in the horror craze, and I got this amazing, like, brand-new book. just came out from Tomorrow's Press. It's called Monster Mash, the Creepy Kooky Monster Craze in America, 1957 to 1972 by Mark Voger. Monster Mash. And this thing is a coffee table book with lots and lots and lots of pictures and interviews and observations about just the age of the American monster. You know, with all the and it so it has all these sections on things like, you know, Dark Shadows collectible books, Aurora model kits, um, eight millimeter castle films that were these you know, 15-minute boil-downs of universal monster things. That, and, you know, I remember you would check those out from the library. So it's just an insane uh, trip down memory lane for for anybody who has either grew up in or has a passing interest to the monster craze of the um, uh, what I would call the late 20th century, the mid to late 20th century. I mean, I was born in the early 70s, uh, and so I was a little past 72, but I have such a fond memory of everything here. So this is a – I love it. Monster Mash. Definitely you should check this out. I will post it. Um, so, oh, oh, and one last thing that we all got to mention is um, we are definitely going to be doing a panel, a Castle of Horror live podcast, our first ever live, live podcast as a panel at the Colorado Horror Con coming in October, uh, Halloween weekend in Denver. And we'll have more details about that as it comes along. But if you want to watch the live Castle of Horror podcast show, uh, we'll be sometime. I don't know what time. I don't know what movie we're going to do, but that's going to happen. So uh, we'll, well, and I'm going to be there all weekend. I'm, I have a table, and I'm going to be selling yeah. uh, Halloween Man comic books because uh, this is what I am doing to celebrate the 15th anniversary of – Halloween man, and I'm glad that we got uh, Castle of Horror uh, wrapped into that as well, because this is this yeah. just going to make it so much more special. I'm I'm super excited. I'm I'm really excited to like come and hang out at the Halloween man table and just harass you. And, and, and... <laughs> oh man, I'm so bummed that I don't think I can go. Like, oh yeah. I hold out hope that you can figure it out. It's only a ten hour drive. It's well, it's, it's more hard. about my role like at my job and getting off time because I'm already taken off for Fantastic Fest and And I don't know what universe you're living in where it's a 10 hour drive it's a 12 hour drive and then 12 hour drive to Dallas like 15 hour drive to oh that's right okay well whatever Uh, (laughs) all right anyway don't give up hope yet we will we will figure it out if you can make it Tony there's a chair for you (laughs) um, and guest room yes of course in a guest room absolutely all right Anyway, that is all we have. 
if you want to hear us argue and, and chat more amongst ourselves about whether we have differing tra travel plans, then uh, you'll have to tune in next week. If you have questions for us, come to the Facebook page. Let us know what you think. Leave a review for us if you haven't done that at iTunes. We totally want to hear what you have to say or what you think. Leaving a review helps people find the show. We are so excited about every, every comment that we ever get. And uh, it is awesome. Thank you, guys. And uh, we got another uh, interview coming th later this week. Uh, if you're on Bleeding Cool, you might be hearing it on Thursday. So that's, uh, we'll be recording that tomorrow night with James Heyman, who writes thrillers. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. We will see you on this show next week. Bye. Night. Later. <laughs>